So let's jump into it. We are in Ephesians, and we're working our way through this Bible, and we're going to land right before Christmas in the Advent season. Today, we're bridging Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 3. Now, in the first week, we learned that we're chosen, and that's why that's this, this series title is Chosen. And we're walking through this, and today, uh, we're going we're gonna to see how we are chosen and built together. So the first week we learned that we're chosen by God. And then we, chose, then we learned that we're chosen to, to live forever, to be made alive in Christ. And today as we examine what it means to be built together, there are some surprise ingredients in God's building plan that, he, that Paul is warning the church in Ephesus about. In this book of Ephesians, Paul is helping the church at Ephesus make sense of what it means to live in light of the resurrection. Because if we don't live in light of the resurrection, in light of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we're going to live in light of the fall of man. And so, and if we live in light of the fall of man, we get the results that we see throughout the world in this time. You get the angst and the hate and the, and, the, and, the, and the sorrow and the pain. But when we live in light of the resurrection, you see unity and you see purpose and you see destiny awakened inside of people and you see a spirit, uh, the Spirit of God move among his church. Now, there's this, uh, this week I was thinking about what is Paul doing here and I felt like he's trying to unleash something that is so subtle it could take over the world. Because he didn't, he didn't tell us to do anything extraordinary and big and huge. And as, as someone who's always trying to do something big, it surprised me. Because, because it's all so subtle. You're chosen. God chose you. And he's made you alive to him. And now he's inviting us to be built into something. Where God is the one acting, not man is the one acting, but God is the one acting. And he's, he's going to be adding people, and we'll get to that in just a second. But Paul is unleashing this thing, and it's kind of the total antithesis of most of the movies that we watch. Most of the movies that we watch, you know, if it's an alien invasion or something else, right? The aliens come and they spawn inside someone, they explode, and then they explode on a person next to them, and then everybody's exploding, and everybody's dying. And is this too graphic for a Sunday morning? I thought about it on a... I thought about it on a Thursday night, so, you know, maybe it didn't fit for a Sunday morning. But, but it's so violent and visceral and disgusting, and, 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 it, and it spreads so quickly, and it's so scary. But there's this innate fear that we have of outside things coming to us, that those movies sell a lot of tickets, and those, those, those movies make a lot of money because we're afraid we're going to be taken over from something on the outside. Wow. And Paul's saying, something from the outside is going to take over, but it's going to be beautiful. Something's going to take over from the outside. His name is Jesus, and he's chosen you to be birthed in his spirit and by his spirit and to bring about the kingdom of heaven in the earth through your relationships and through with, with him and with one another. And so Paul is, Paul is telling a different kind of story here, and I'm excited to jump into it. Um, but because we're covering so much ground, I'm not going to read the second half of Ephesians and the first half of, of, uh, or of Ephesians 2 and the first half of Ephesians 3. What I'm going to do is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. And then we're going to read verse 6 and verse 4 of chapter 3. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Chapter 3, verse 6. There's this mystery being revealed, and he said, The mystery is this, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise with Christ Jesus through the, in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Down to verse 10. So that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This is God's word to us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you, and I, we thank you for your word. We're, thank you, we're thankful this morning that it changes us. We're thankful that 
this morning that through it, you're going to speak to us. And I ask that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to comprehend what you're speaking to us today in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. 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 So we see that we're, uh, we're, we're brought to life, and we see that we're chosen, and now we're talking about being built together. And so I, I couldn't decide today on my points if it was going to be unity, mystery, and clarity, or just clarity, clarity, clarity. <laughs> so you can write down both if you want. Wow. Because the reality is Paul is just clarifying what it means to be unified. He's clarifying the mystery of the gospel, and he's clarifying for us uh, the, the, what it is that all of everything he's going to talk about produces in the world. So we see in these, in, at the end of chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, that God is building a house, that he's building a, a structure, and, the, and the, the, the building material of choice is your life. Those who he has brought to life from the dead. It's your life. It's those who are, who are coming together under, under the saving relationship with Jesus. You are God's chosen materials to build with. And as, as, the, as the people of Ephesus would have heard Paul saying this, you can imagine that their hearts were stirred. God wants to use me. Do you feel that way a little bit? God wants to use me. He wants to build with me. Even though, I've, even though I've done that stuff, even though I've been that way, God is choosing to use me and he wants to build with me and he's building this momentum and he says, but just one thing about this building is that it's built on the cornerstone of Jesus. And the cornerstone sets the pace for the rest of the building. It determines where everything else is going to land. It makes sure that everything else stays in line because as they're building, they're constantly looking back to the cornerstone. For a little while, I had to line the soccer fields for my kids, and, and as I was, as my volunteer service to the league, and so as I'm lining the fields, I was lining it with this guy that, that was really, he was just looking like straight down, and as he was looking straight down, he felt like he was going straight the whole distance, but then when he turned around and looked at his line, it was insane. It was so crooked. It was so wobbly. And, and I'm not just talking like a little bit of like trembles. I'm like, like a three-yard gap. It was going to be quite a job for the refs to determine. They would have had to establish a trend line between it to, to figure out what the real boundaries of the fields were. And so, so, but because he was looking straight down and he wasn't paying attention to, to something else, he didn't know how to line up. The corners, you can do the same thing when you're building a building. You can, you can start building, and if you're just focusing on brick by brick by brick, you might not realize that your bricks aren't actually lining up. Or even if they're lining up with each other, they might not be lining up with the rest of the building. So by sending everything back to the cornerstone, we make sure that the thing that we're building is in line with God's purpose. It's in line with his heart. It's in line with his mind. It's in line with what he has in mind for the building. And, and, being, and he has something in mind for his building. That's good. The idea for this building is that it would contain God. It would contain his presence. It would contain his glory. And, it would, and his glory would be revealed to the earth through this building that he's building. But we've got to make sure that we're looking to the cornerstone. So that we don't build a wonky building that isn't much good for anything. But it's not just you and the cornerstone. Don't we wish it was sometimes? I just, <laughs> it's, a, it's a common joke in some circles that uh, ministry is great except for the people. <laughs> right? It's brutal. Did I bring you too far behind the curtain? Was that inappropriate? Okay. All right. Well, go <laughs> but the reality is without the people, there's no ministry. And everything about this book is not written to an individual. It's written to a group of people. It's written to a group of people that are being brought together, much like Hope Valley Church. We're right here at the beginning of this thing. We're a brand new church, and we come from all kinds of different backgrounds, and we bring all kinds of different expectations, and we have all kinds of different hopes, and we have all kinds of different pains. Some of us are running from our pain. Some of us are running back to something that was glorious in the past, and we're trying to recover that. Some of us are just kind of along for the ride, not like trying out Jesus for the first time in a long time, or maybe the first time ever, and you're like, I'm 
just trying to figure this out, but we all have these ideas about how we think that it should go. And Jesus is saying, uh, Paul is saying, let Jesus be the one who determines how this thing can go because that's the only way that it can be what you, it was designed to be in the first place. And it's going to require that you do this as individuals, but it's also going to require that you do this together as a people. And that sounds pretty good when you think about the people that you like. Like, oh, he's going to build a house for himself. And, and, and by the Spirit of God, he's going to bring us together and it's going to be amazing because we think the same. And we agree about these things. Isn't that amazing? And Paul's like, there's just one thing. <laughs> there's just one thing about this building. And this is, this is and, and he's, about to, he's about to shock them. He's about to burst their little Christian bubble. He's about to uh, interrupt this kind of celebration that I'm sure that they were going through as they were hearing that God's chosen me. He's chosen us, Megan. Isn't this, Andrew, he's chosen us. Isn't this wonderful? And, and we're going to vote the same way. And we're going to agree about masks the same way. And we're going we're gonna to think about vaccines the same way. Oh, and we're going to like the same songs and worship. You're going to like the same experience that I like. You're going to like that folk stuff. And you're going to like that God or, or that God. We're all going to like the same stuff. It's going to be amazing. And Paul's about to let them in on the recipe for God's building. He's about to let them know about the building supplies that God is choosing for this work. And it's going to surprise them. I, as a kid, there was this, this cake my mom would make. It's called German chocolate cake. And we loved it. Yes. We loved it. It was amazing. And then I watched her cook it one time. Y'all know there's sauerkraut in that thing? Sauerkraut. I was so offended that this thing I loved so much had this thing that I hated so much as a primary ingredient. I was a, ah, mom, why do you have that disgusting food right next to that glory? And she's like, that glory is made up of that disgusting food. And without that disgusting food, you don't have the glory. It's starting to sound like Nacho Libre. Don't you want to taste of the glory? It wasn't a Nacho's reference, but it was a Nacho Libre reference. It's pretty close. Pretty close. We could talk about Nachos later if it, if it comes up. But he's about, to, he's about to shock them. Did you know, I mean, mo because we're addicted to memes and everything, you might already know this, but, but some vanilla flavoring oh, no. is made of be beaver anus glands, anal glands. <laughs> Did you guys know this? <laughs> beaver <laughs> anal glands <laughs> make that vanilla flavoring that you love so much. How about them apples? It's natural. <laughs> so when you, when you read that label, it says natural flavors. You just don't know what you're getting. But before you get too grossed out, let me just encourage you that it actually is disgusting. There's nothing. Just be grossed out. But your, your favorite dessert wouldn't taste so great. Except for that really strange ingredient. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles... Assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by this revelation as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and to the prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body and partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Yes. You're not the only ones who are being brought to life by Christ. You aren't the only ones who have been chosen by him. You aren't the only ones who have been called as sons and daughters and adopted into the, into the house of Jesus and set at the seat of honor as his, as his children. It's not just you. Makes me wonder how that felt the first time they heard it. Were they excited because they understood it? Were they disappointed because it bothered them? 
These Gentiles, so a Gentile is anybody who wasn't a, a Jew. And so the Jewish people, uh, we've got to remember, sometimes we can flip it in our head and we think that the Jewish population was the prominent, was the prominent people because we've got these things that the, the winners write history and, and, the, and the, the conquering societies write the books. But in this case, the Jewish people were a small group of people and the Christian people were a small group in the Jewish people in this Gentile world by whom they were being oppressed generation after generation generation after generation after generation. In fact, most of the time when God was going to bring judgment on the Jewish people, he did it with the Gentiles. And so these are not people who are just kind of like eating with their right hand or their left hand. This wasn't people who preferred a vegan diet. (laughs) I hope that comes out on the recording. These were people who were so far different than them that they they never interacted. The story of the Good Samaritan was shocking because a Samaritan person was thought to be filthy and disgusting. And so the thought of a filthy and disgusting person helping anyone shocked their minds. But now we've got a phrase, the Good Samaritan. We're like, that's a good person, somebody we want to know, somebody we want to walk with, somebody we want to to live with, somebody we want to have over to our house. Jesus was shocking them awake to the reality of the kingdom, and now Paul is doing the same thing, and he's saying these these Gentiles, these people who you'd, you'd rather not fellowship with are actually critical parts of what God is building in the earth, in and through his church. So fellow heirs, you know, can you imagine the excitement of, of adopting somebody into your family? That's what he's saying. You're, you're like adopting them into your family, but it's, this is somebody that, that they, they'd rather not be with. Yeah. And now, not only is this person being adopted into the family, but being an heir means that they're going to get an equal piece of God's yeah. pie. Yeah. And so what we can do sometimes is we can get insecure because we're afraid that God's going to run out. Anybody been afraid out? Anybody been afraid to pray for somebody else's promotion because you think it might cost you your promotion? Anybody been, you know, anybody else been afraid to pray for somebody else to get a spouse because you're afraid they're going to take your spouse? Has anybody been, has anybody been afraid to forgive someone because if you forgive them, nobody else is going to hold them accountable? Right? This is the way that we think because we think that God is like us and we make God in our image instead of realizing that we live in his image and that, and that he is vastly different than we are and he doesn't run out. We talked about this last week. He's rich in mercy. He doesn't run out of mercy. He is rich in love. He doesn't run out of love. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. There's a psalm, I think it's 147, devoted to that idea. It says it's like 27 times how the mercy of the Lord endures forever. You're going to look at it, you're going to fact check me? Just just let me know. Or just read all of Psalms until you get there. We'll do it that way. The mystery is that those people are us people. They're fellow heirs and they're getting the same, the same portion that you're getting. Yes, that person who voted dark red. Yes, that person who dar- voted dark blue. We can't just celebrate the middle. Yes, the people in the middle also. The people who were there on January 6th. Mm -hmm. The people who were heartbroken on January 6th. Mm -hmm. Those people are us people in Christ. It's hard to amen, isn't it? That's a quiet quiet one. That was worthy of a quiet amen, Denzel. The partakers of the promise... In Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's why Paul spent so much time setting up the grace of God. That's why he used the word grace three times in four verses in chapter chapter 2. is because he's trying to drive this home. That your relationship with Jesus, though you have to sustain it and put some effort into it, isn't because you earned it. And the people who Jesus is inviting in to be a part of this building didn't earn it either. But we put forth effort to steward it well. 
Here's what I'm really excited about today. So why is he building this way? Why the sauerkraut and the cake? Why the anal glands in my ice cream? <laughs> That's two weeks in a row that I just lost everybody. <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah, you're like, why, David? Why, David? Why? I'll tell you why. Paul says, I've been made a minister of this gospel according to this gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power to me, though I'm the very least of the saints. Now, I want to pause right here for just a moment. Paul calls himself the least of the saints, and he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Yes. So two things to realize here. That you are a saint with him. Mm -hmm. That you are a fellow heir with him. Mm -hmm. That you are a fellow partaker with him. And that you are a member with him. And he's setting the pace by saying, hey guys, we're going to have to get low if this is going to work. Yes. I'm not telling you how great I am. I'm not boasting about the great revelation that I have. I'm the least of them. I mean, Jesus appeared to him on a road, made him blind, and then he was healed by a man named Ananias. Yeah. He had an extraordinary conversion, and he's saying, I'm the least of them. I'm the smallest of them. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in, in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We can make a mistake of being so excited about Christ's love for us that we forget about Christ's love for others. Come on. That's good. We, can be, we can so correctly understand that you are God's cherished and prized daughter or son that you are a prized possession to him and so wrongly think that you're the only one at the same time. Yeah. And Paul's like, I want to fix this way of thinking because if we can fix this way of thinking early in our DNA as a church, Ephesus, if we can fix this way of thinking early in our DNA, Hope Valley, we could establish something that reveals mystery of heaven to the world. To bring to light what, is this, what has been this plan from the very beginning. The word that Paul chooses to use here, manifold wisdom, means multicolored wisdom. Are you already preaching the sermon to yourself? The church, we love to go to Revelation. And talk about how every tribe and every tongue will worship Jesus. Every knee will bow. And we love to go there and celebrate that. And, but we make a mistake if we think that that's the first time it's happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's supposed to happen here, right now, first. Come on. To bring about the future. We want to be a church that looks like heaven yes. in, our, in the diversity of the people that we are, in our passion for God and for the, the, the good that we bring about in our city. That's what we want to be. But I can't do it for us. Correct. Yes. You're going to have to do it with us yes. or it's not going to happen. It's good. And as a pastor, that's terrifying <laughs> because the thing that I want to happen the most that I believe that God wants to do the most in our city, I can't do. Wow. All we can do is create the right environment 
for you to make friends with people who aren't like you, who vote different than you do or believe different than you do. Not about, Jesus, not about the most important thing. Not about Jesus. Like we're, we, we've got, we're, we're orthodox. We're not, just taking, we're not saying everything goes and there are no, like it's not, it's not like that. We have, we have clear doctrine about who Jesus is and, and what it means to walk with him. But we, but we, but we got to make sure that we hold the other things loosely. And that's going to offend every single one of you if you walk with us for more than a, an election cycle. Oh, elections. I hate them so much. <laughs> we'll offend you before we get to the election cycle by the fact that we've got distance to seating on the sides or we don't have enough distance to seating. Yes. We'll find a way. But the multicolored wisdom of God I, I believe, can be filled in and through us as a church if we set our hearts to be the church that Paul is inviting Ephesus to become. And we let Jesus shape our hearts and minds the way that he needs to. So let me ask this question, and this, this, is gonna, this hurts. Who do you not want to receive the grace of God? You might not say it that way. We all want everybody to get the grace of God, but who would you rather not have sitting on your row? It's already people, people pointing at each other on the front rows. <laughs> Who would you rather leave out? Is it a political point? Is it, is it a lifestyle choice? Too many tattoos, not enough tattoos? Likes hiking too much, not enough. Come on. Yeah. Likes artificial vanilla. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't, like artificial vanilla. <laughs> doesn't like artificial vanilla flavoring. <laughs> the manifold wisdom of God will be revealed to the world when the church starts looking like heaven instead of waiting for heaven to redo what happened in the church. This is the invitation to us. It's an invitation that I'm excited about. It's an invitation that has been the source of many tears, much frustration, a lot of confusion. That's why the source, the purpose of the building is really important. That's why, that's why I, I really don't like, I, I've talked about this before, but I'm not trying to rewrite the Bible. Don't, don't take this the wrong way. But, but like the chapter headings and verses were added in the 13th and 15th century. And the subheadings were added by editors much later than that. But sometimes what we do is we separate really important ideas in the Bible from each other so that we think something else is happening. So, for example, in my Bible, it says that we're one in Christ in Ephesians 2, verse 11 through, um, through 22. And then, and then in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, the mystery of the gospel revealed as if we're not still talking about being one in Christ. And so we got to make sure that we don't accidentally let these cues that were put there for, to aid us in our reading to help us break it up so that we could talk about it more easily among each other if we weren't able to memorize the whole thing. Uh, we need to be careful that we don't let that set up firm barriers and boundaries in the Word that keep us from being able to understand it as a comprehensive, as a comprehensive piece. This was a letter. So you could, you could write any letter to any person and then break it up with chapters and verses, and then you'll see how weird it can get. Yes. Like, oh, I love you. Is this a different thought or was that connected to the other thought that I owe you 20 bucks? <laughs> right? Was that, are you still upset about what happened at Thanksgiving or do you love me or you love me even though Thanksgiving happened or you love me separate from what happened at Thanksgiving? I can't make sense of it because of where the chapter and the verses are. Keep the chapters and verses, but, but, but don't let them keep you from seeing the Bible as a comprehensive work. And, and the book of Ephesians as a letter that's written to a group, group of people to, to lay the foundation and the framework by which Paul was going to help them along later. Yes. Amen? Amen? So this is our invitation. It's to get low, like Paul. 
and allow the Spirit of God to build us together with one another who are here and who are like us and also those who are here and unlike us, those who are not yet here and are like us and those who are not yet here and unlike us. That's the invitation from Paul, and that's the invitation from God to us today, to allow him to build us together to the building of his creation so that the purpose of God could be revealed in and through the church instead of having to make up for what the church has done. I got asked the question recently, what do you think God's up to with with the church lately? (laughs) Do we have a year He's shaking it. Yes. He's shaking it because he wants to shape it. Yes. He wants it to look more like heaven. Yes. So he's shaking it up. Y'all, I'm excited about what God's doing here. I'm excited about what God was doing, was doing there. I'm excited that we're here because of what they did in response to this. I'm excited that generation after generation after generation, since this letter was written, they have been faithful to pass it on to people who weren't like them. Crossing crossing streets and train tracks. They were crossing county boundaries and city boundaries and crossing national boundaries. Through every kind of government and through every kind of and through every kind of family situation and through every kind of difficulty, through every kind of glory, the church continues to advance when she's faithful to be who God's created her to be and allow God to place us as He would desire us to be placed. And that's our invitation today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would make us this kind of church. That the manifold wisdom of God would be made known in and through us. God, I, I, I pray for every person in here who is, who's, who's hurt so deeply that they can't imagine inviting someone to share life with. I ask that your comfort would come. I ask that your grace would abound. I ask that your peace would, would overwhelm them right now in this moment and going forward. God, I'm asking that you would give us a greater revelation of, of the distance that you traveled to redeem us, of the distance that you went to save us from ourselves, that the, the, the price that you paid so that we could be brought from death to life. God, help us understand that more deeply so that we can extend that grace to other people so that we can be like Paul and say, I'm just the least of these saints and this grace of God has been given me to proclaim the excellencies of the richness, the riches of Christ. Father, help us. Help us to build this way. Help us to walk humbly with one another and to love one another well, even when we don't agree. Let your light shine on us, I ask in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Amen. I do want to, I want to clarify one thing. Yeah, you're in the right place. You did the right thing. I want to clarify something that I I said. This is going to look really funny the way I dance with the music stand. I want to clarify something. I, I, I talked about, though briefly, how the Gentiles were the oppressors to the Jews, and now the Jews were taking the ministry of the gospel to the oppressor. And then, and then when I prayed, I prayed that if people, if there's somebody that you hate so much that you can't imagine, God's like, move our hearts, right? I do want to say that I'm, I'm not saying ignore the pain. I'm not saying act like you haven't been offended or hurt. I'm not saying act like you haven't been wronged. I'm not saying act like there's no such thing as right and wrong. I don't, I just, I I wanted to use a few more words to help, to help articulate this thought that if you're in that position and you find it impossible to reach across to some kind of person or a certain uh, demographic of person, that's, that's a time where, where you can talk to someone you trust. I, I hope that you can begin to find trust in, in me as a pastor and our leadership team, Pastor Andrew and Pastor Megan and in, in, in the others on the team, worship lead, you know, like, hey, we got leaders all over the place because we're, we're blessed with a small church and a lot of people who are serving. But, um, but I, I would say to you, if, if there's a, a, a line that you can't reach across, 
I'm not saying ignore it and act like it's not there and reach across. What I'm saying is talk to some people and let's pray for the grace of God to appear to you. And as the grace appears to you, let's change the world together. That's good. Amen. 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 All right.